1 Timothy 6 and 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Where art thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. We have been teaching on this series called The Fight of Faith. And so far we've come through nine of these sessions. The last two weeks we've been talking about be not weary and well-doing. And tonight I'm going to try to kind of wrap that portion of this teaching up. Uh, but with a slightly different title. So what I want you to do right now is I just want to take a moment and I want us to pray and ask the Lord that he would help us tonight. I've had a long day. We've been five and a half hours in various board meetings with Tupelo Children's Mansion, board meetings with CSB, finishing to prep to teach. And, and uh, so I need God to help my brain a little bit here to, to flow in, in tune. In the name of Jesus, Father, we love you. We thank you for this beautiful presence that I feel and God, I ask you for your, your help, that anointing that comes. Let it flow again tonight in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Greet four or five folks real quick where you're at and around you, and then you can be seated in Jesus' name. Now, I want to, I wanna, the last two weeks we've been talking about be not weary and well-doing, and we've discussed some stuff like that, but... Tonight I want to bring a couple scriptures to start with. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13 says, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Now, we've read that one during this time. But let's go now to Hebrews 12 and 3. For consider him, this is talking about Jesus, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Everybody say faint in your minds. And then 2 Corinthians 4 and 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we have received mercy, we faint not. Hope not anyway. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, dishonesty not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But again, I want you to notice the, the, the theme. Uh, we faint not, Galatians 6 and 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if what? If what? Yell it. So with these verses in mind, if you'll bring up the title slide, this is what I want to title tonight. I want to talk about fainting spells. <laughs> because we have too many of these things that happen to people spiritually. And uh, we, need to, we need some victory over that. Because the scripture teaches us that we should not. Now we're going to get weary. You know, things wear us down. But, but we cannot afford to get so weary that we faint. Where we become faint in our mind. Now, uh, again, there's no question we, we wrestle against weariness, but fainting spells can be dangerous. Now, many times the fainting itself may not be all that harmful, but it's what you hit your head on on the way down that can be a little harmful. Uh, I was stunned to find out that one-third of the population has occasional fainting spells. And basically that's just kind of described as that one minute you're doing something and the next minute you wake up on the floor <laughs> and you have no idea what happened or how you got there. Uh, medically, I think it's called uh, syncope, I, I believe is how it's pronounced. Uh, but it, it's just a, a medical term for fainting. And it's just, again, a temporary loss of consciousness, loss of muscle control, and usually it's affected uh, with low blood flow to the brain. And again, most of the time, fainting spells are, are, are not all that problematic. But I will tell you this, spiritually, they can be very problematic. And that's the kind we're talking about tonight. So before I swing into that particular thing, I want to back up just a moment and finish a couple things that I was working on last week that we didn't get done. We were talking about a couple of things to help keep us from getting that weary to begin with. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 4. And uh, in verse 18, if you'll bring it up on screen, and, and this is all scriptures that we are familiar with, but can I remind you that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Everybody say, upon me. Mm -hmm. 
because, now here's why the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jesus, as he said. He hath anointed me to. In other words, he's anointed me to do something. Do things. Okay. We're not anointed to sit on a pew. There's no special anointing for a nap. But anointings come to help us accomplish things. Now, in Jesus' case, he said there were six things. The Spirit of the Lord has come on me to anoint me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So God's anointing, again, comes on us to do things, to accomplish things. So we have giftings and, and, and anointings and talents that God gives us. But we also need anointings to come on that energizes the natural talents that God gives us. And one of the things that wears all of us down is when we are engaged in spiritual battles. This has been a tiring year. Of, of spiritual battles for my home for, for certain and I know many of your homes as well and I, I will tell you this we need some fresh anointing for new battles we need new anointing for new battles maybe I can say it that way a new conflict a new level of warfare a new issue that arises uh, is very possible that it needs a new anointing to match it because there's times in our, in our spiritual war that uh, Satan ups his game, changes strategies, tries something new. And when, the, and when he changes tactics, uh, we need to come back to the altar and come back to the prayer room and get a fresh anointing to compensate against what we already read that he said we need to watch for is the wiles of the devil. How many of you encountered the wiles of the devil? <laughs> he's a wily devil. <laughs> only he, he's like wily coyote, only he's smarter. <laughs> that was wily coyote's downfall. He just wasn't the brightest bulb in the, uh, in the place. <laughs> Think about David for a minute. We talked about his battles during the, during the time. You know, but they were progressive. He, 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 he had battles with animals to start. We had a battle with a, a bear. And he had a battle with a lion. And he had a battle with Goliath. And then he had battles with all the Philistines. And if you, if you chart the progression of his battles, they got bigger and greater. The enemies became larger and stronger. And when the battle rages, the presence of God and the anointing of God is needful to come in and help us to deal with whatever it is we're dealing with. Amen? And if that's, the, if that's true, and by the way, that's why, we, again, we need that armor, that spiritual armor we started out talking about in all of this series about fighting the good fight of faith. And, and we have to get it on because, uh, if, as a matter of fact, I read one thing about, about people who are feeling faint. They said if you're feeling faint, I thought this was pretty decent uh, uh, advice that if you're by yourself and you know and you feel something coming up, try to try to get to a corner as fast as you can, <laughs> and just lean into the corner. <laughs> and hopefully, if you go out, it'll it'll slide you down, and you won't be banging your head all over the place. <laughs> but in spiritual warfare, there are times that 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 we start to get overwhelmed with new tactics, new strategies, new levels. How many of you can testify that there's been times in spiritual warfare? When you just, you're so tired, you've had victory, God's been good, and it's just, but it's just been a long, you know, and I'm tired, and I'm tired, and all of a sudden, a brand new, fresh, nutsy thing comes on you. <laughs> and when you're weary and you're tired, you've got to have a fresh anointing. Now, in order to get the fresh anointing, now listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. We have to be careful that we don't learn to replace prayer with praise. Yeah, and you know why it got so quiet there in a minute? Because all of us have done it. 
And there was an immediate witness in our spirits. Said, oh, Back in 1906, during the days of Azusa Street, there was a prophecy that went forth that was uh, relatively famous. And I, I had heard of it before, but I was reminded of it recently. And I'll be honest with you, it troubles me a little bit because w w during Azusa Street, a prophetic word came forth that said in the, the last days... There would be the, the last day's church or the church in the last days would be a people that would worship a God that they would not pray to. Now, I don't, I don't want to believe that that's, that's the apostolic church because the last day's church is going to be a powerful church. But I do think that there is something to be said for, for a people, a religious people that worship a God they would not pray to. In other words, they would emphasize worship. They'd have no problem with the music and the singing and the lights and, the, and, and, and all of that. But when it comes time to pray, they know how to worship, but they don't know how to pray. And worship is critical. But here's, here's where my concern is. Lest you think it can't be talking about us, I observed something the last few weeks in light of this. And I remember the first night that we did the, the NAC Now service. It was on a Friday night, off night, nothing else going on. And uh, if I remember right, it was even during a, a, a pretty busy holiday week, if I remember. Anyway, over 90 people came out on a Friday night to sing and shout and worship. But I watched during our quarterly prayer meetings. And it only looked to me like about 40 people coming and going. And I begin to watch this. Every time if we announce, if we announce worship and praise, yeah, we're on that. We'll trip over ourselves to get here to get the tambourines out. But we'll find every excuse in the world to get busy during, during time of prayer. Well, hallelujah. Now, pr pr praise and worship is powerful. And, and, and it, it, is, it has benefit. But I want you to know something. You can't make it just on praise alone. He said his house would be called a house of prayer. Not necessarily house of praise, though we understand it certainly is that. But we can't allow praise to take the place of prayer. It just needs to be added to our prayer. We cannot survive battle as soldiers uh, in, in this fight of faith without knowing how to pray. Bring up Ephesians 6 and 17. When he said, take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying always. Everybody say, praying always. With all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, Watching, therefore, with perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Did you notice the emphasis in the warfare time is prayer, 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 supplication. It wasn't necessarily a worship service. Now, praise has great benefits. Believe me, I know. Worship has great benefits. But the thing that's interesting about it is praise and worship benefit God whereas prayer tends to benefit us. In other words, it brings a strength back to us. Now, so that's one thing that we need to do to avoid getting, when you're, when you're starting to get worn down, start to ask yourself, have I been, have I been trading praise for prayer? That's one thing. Look, another, another thing that'll help you is try to avoid allowing people to make you a human trash can. For all of their issues that are going on. Well, I felt the anointing on that anyway. <laughs> now, carnal people, especially if they're, you know, if they're being weak and carnal, I should say, they think nothing of dumping out everything on them because they want to feel better. And they do tend to feel better. You know how it is when you feel like you've unloaded yourself on somebody. You know, I'm glad you feel better, of course. You just put the person you unloaded on into depression. <laughs> and and, and you, you dump on people. You need to avoid, don't allow people to, to, to just dump on you uh, 
without any kind of parameters to it. Uh, because it bring, especially when they're just bringing blame or criticism or depression, we need to be helping others. And there's times that there's a place for that. But compassion does not require self-destruction. Okay. And when you start feeling stuff's getting buried on you, that, that, that you need to remember, the Bible says, cast your care upon him, for he careth for you. So don't, don't dump stuff on others that you haven't first taken to the Lord. And, and there's times when we're having issues, there are places the Bible teaches us of where to go to get the instruction and help that we need. Now, here's the real, real truth. I've been preaching for 40 years, and here's what I can tell you for a fact. There are a lot of people who, will, who they love to sit and talk and go in circles, uh, but they don't listen to what they're being told. They don't follow the counsel they're given, and then later they'll turn around and tell you, tell you or others or whoever, well, you know, pastor just doesn't care. You know, he, he, he doesn't listen when I talk. You know, you got to understand, there's a difference between listening and agreeing. <laughs> I can listen to you. That doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you. <laughs> and if I don't agree with you, don't assume I haven't listened to you. But my fuse, the older I get, my fuse is getting shorter and shorter with people that don't listen, not because I'm mad about it. I just don't have the time to go in circles uh, as much. I, I, got, I got other things that's got to be done. So if you have a real problem, I'll sit down with it. Let's, let's try to diagnose this. If I can't do it, I'll try to route you to somebody that can. But, but, but don't take stuff that requires instruction and expect to get counsel you got to be careful where you get your counsel from and one of the worst places to get counsel is from one of your peers so i want somebody that's going through the same thing i am because they understand no no you want somebody that has either successfully come through or successfully avoided what you're in <laughs> that's the counsel you need so learn to fight and win some battles on your own. And don't let people trap you with, listen, I, I got to tell you something, but don't tell anyone. And, and, and you can't tell anyone. You can't tell even pastor. You can't tell. I, I, I have a rule. I, said, I, don't, I won't do it. I've told people, don't do it. I've told all of our department heads and ministers, don't do it. You'll regret it. <laughs> because the reality of the matter, it, it, it would be the same as going to the doctor. And you know how they take you in, you know, you have an intake nurse that usually taking your blood pressure and all that, and you unload on, on them and tell them all the things going on, and they say, but whatever you do, don't tell the doctor. <laughs> it's between me and you. <laughs> well, if they kept it between me and you, they'd be fired. Because, because they're there to get information. They're not there to disseminate information necessarily. And the same is true in the kingdom of God. There are people that are there to be an ear, to be a kind, to be a friend. But there are other people that have been placed in the body by the, by the Lord himself that are there to disperse instruction from the word of God. But the problem is sometimes we don't want to hear it. And so we try to avoid that and just go to everybody else. And we'll go to 10, 12, 14 people looking for anybody who will agree with us. And then they are our friend. Everybody else just doesn't understand me. Don't let people trap you with that stuff. Um, and, and by the way, if you're, if you're encountering anything that has to do with church unity or, or the, or the uh, personal soul situation, somebody, somebody's going to be lost or, or it could be over abuse or something like that going on, it must be shared. My wife said something years ago that, that has stuck with me. She doesn't maybe even fool it, but I've told this in ministers' meetings. Stuff. It's, become a, it's become a famous saying, but I remember that day when she said, I, I just, I'm tired of feeling bad about what other people ought to be feeling bad about. And sometimes you, we, we take all this stuff in, and we're depressed. And, we're, and I have been in sessions with people where I've tried to minister to people, and when it's all said and done, I felt worse than they did. <laughs> And, I, and I've concluded they didn't really want an answer. They just wanted to talk. 
Now, if you, I, I'm, I'd rather be in the answers business than the go in circles business. <laughs> and so, again, don't let people trap you into a place where it's wearing you and wearing you out. If you're in that kind of situation, you need to get to the ministry quick and help us to discern how to get you out of that situation. Another thing is, and this is important, I want you to listen very carefully to me. We have to learn to differentiate the difference between being called and being burdened about something. Um, I think this is a powerful revelation to understand. I can feel a burden just due to need. I, I was in a four-hour board meeting today uh, for Tupelo Children's Master. I'm on the board of directors for them, and I was, we were in a Zoom meeting for over four hours a day doing reports, doing business for the, for the mansion. Well, but in the middle of it, there, there were 75 of us that were in this meeting. In the middle of it, they're giving reports and stories about some of the kids and some of the stuff that's happening, stuff they can't even allow to become public. It just And I'm telling you, half of us were just, we're, I saw glasses start to come off and people start wiping their eyes. and Half of us were bawling by the time we got halfway through that thing. And I got a burden. And I responded to the burden. And uh, we voted today to build a new building down there. And just so you know, there's three and a half thousand dollars from our missions account that's going toward it. <laughs> but because because I, I got a burden, I got a burden. But but now that burden doesn't mean I'm called to Tupelo to go solve that problem. So, but man, I feel a burden. I feel, but you know, I, I tell you where. Here's what you got to be careful of. Now, I can, try to, I can try to do things as best as I can to help any way that I can, but I have to be careful that I don't try to do things that I'm not called to do because I could end up doing damage to my own spiritual walk. Now, sometimes you may not know that without a little bit of trial and error, so I'm not suggesting that we don't try things. But I think you ought to understand there are some things you need to go into with a thing, even if we're not saying, Lord, I'm not sure. I know I got a burden for this, but I, whether I'm called to solve this problem, I don't know. But maybe I'll try. I, mean, I got counsel to try. We're, we're going to see. And, and quite honestly, I did that when I came to Norfolk. Uh, and, you know, global missions is probably a common example of this. Because if, if you've ever sat in a mission service, you should get a burden for missions. You should get it. And almost any country that the missionary is telling you the story from and showing you the slides, you ought to be sitting there thinking, man, I feel called <laughs> to that country, to that, you know. Now, because that's a burden. And God has to give burden to, to, to people because the burden goes along with helping us to help those who are called. To do that, and it's not always easy to find that different. Again, it's trial and error. But you, many of you know the story. But when I, before I came to Norfolk, I was absolutely convinced that God was calling me to Leesburg, Virginia, uh, to start a church. I, 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 I've been through all kinds of um, mental gymnastics. I, I, I was praying. I had such a burden. God had laid a burden for Leesburg on me. And I mean, just, it was unrelenting. And, and, and this has gone on for weeks. And, and finally, I got over all of my, and my, my fears and my anxieties. And I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. And by the way, if you don't know where Leesburg is, it's Loudoun County, right in the middle of where that nutty mess is going on outside of D.C. with the school boards. <laughs> and it, in the middle of all of that, I finally got up the curtain and said, okay, God, I'm going to do it. I'm weaving, God. I'm going to obey you, God. I pick up the phone and call the superintendent, asking for an application at the time. And I'll never forget it because at the time when I asked, I'll never forget I, I unburdened my soul to him for a few minutes, and I'll never forget his voice. He just said, well, Brother Blankenship, Brother Bailey just moved there this week. And my first reaction will tell him to get out. <laughs> what gives? God's calling me there. <laughs> and Leesburg is not a big city, so it would be nonsensical to put two missionaries together in, in the same town at the same time. So anyway, I... I told Brother Kelly, I said, I, I, my hat's in the hand, sir. I obviously got to go back to the 
to the drawing board and go back to Charlton and see what, I, I don't know what God's doing, but I'm telling you, I've had such a burden. And he's okay. And so we got off the phone. And I'm telling you, when I hung up the phone, the entire burden of Leesburg just lifted off of me like a balloon. Now I'm more confused than I ever was. <laughs> Because I've been working and nursing this burden for weeks, months, literally. And it was gone like that. And so I'm obviously calling on the name of the Lord for help. Because, Lord, you're either doing something or I'm losing my mind. I don't know which is happening. But God finally spoke to me and he said, I was never calling you to Leesburg. I was calling Bill Bailey to Leesburg. I was using you to intercede for him and to pray him on the location. Amen. Amen. Now, I wish he would have explained that to me from the beginning. <laughs> would have saved me a lot of anxiety, you know. So my point that I'm, I'm saying, I don't want you to misunderstand, burden's important. But, but the truth is, if you're sensitive to God and you're walk with God's in, in halfway decent order, you should be feeling burden for a lot of things. A lot of things ought to be able to move you, and you feel, I, I need to help this. And, I need, and there may be occasional times where certain things rise to the surface. There's a stronger burden than anything. And when that's happening, you know, okay, it, it probably needs to be explored a little bit. And maybe, you know, get counsel from the ministry and that kind of stuff and see what we can do. But I, I, I'm saying there's, there's no easy answer to this. All I'm saying is, though, is there is a difference between being called and being burdened. And sometimes the people who are burdened are a lot bigger number than those that are called. Let me show you an example of it. 2 Samuel 7, bring it up on screen. It came to pass that when the king sat in his house, the Lord had given him rest about from all of his enemies. And the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar. This is David talking. But the ark of God dwells within curtains. And Nathan, I always, I always got a kick out of this. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart. The Lord is with me. You know, all of us get excited sometimes. And Nathan, who's the prophet, starts sparking off. He didn't have a word from God. He had his own excitement that was generated because the truth is, he knew where David was going with this. And it made total sense. So he's like, I'm on board. I'm, I'm on board. You know, I've sat in presentations where they're presenting a need for something. And I got it you know, 10 minutes before they come to the end of it. I'm ready to, I'm ready to respond, ready to give, and they're still talking. I'd say, I, I'm with you, you know. I got it. What do we do? It made sense, but it was wrong. Because in verse 4, it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt, thou shalt build me a house, or, or shalt thou build me a house to dwell in? Question mark, excuse me. Are you really going to do this? I know, I know that Nathan felt kind of silly at that point because he'd been encouraging him all afternoon. But now he did have a word from the Lord. And the word of the Lord, if you read the story, we don't have time for all that tonight, but the bottom line is God looked at David's burden and told him, he said, you've, you've, you've been a, a man of bloodshed. You've shed too much blood. That's not who I, I'm not calling you to build the temple. I'm going to allow your son Solomon to do that. So God literally, there was nothing wrong, by the way, with David's burden. It was totally appropriate burden. But God said, no, I've called somebody else to do that. David, too much bloodshed. You're a man of war. So Solomon built the temple. Solomon dedicated the temple. He even called Solomon's temple. But let me tell you something. When you read the whole story of what went on behind the scenes, uh, Sol Solomon obviously played a huge role in it. But I want to tell you who else played a huge role in it. It was his daddy, David. Because when David got an understanding from God that he has a burden for it, but he can't be the one that does it, he was going to make sure that that thing's going to be a success. And David ended up supplying a huge amount of the materials and the physical things needed for Solomon to organize and build that temple. Here's the point. Once he found out he was not necessarily the one called, he simply changed roles and became a supporter of the vision. 
the worst thing you can do is to feel a burden of something or feel a desire to do something. And if you find out that wasn't God's first choice, uh, then all of a sudden I've seen people literally get mad at God. Just sit on the sidelines. Well, if I can't do what I want to do, and, and that's, not, that's not how we need to be. Listen, we are all money in the, in the pocket of the Lord. He can spend us on anything he wants. And sometimes he doesn't always choose the same thing that we would choose. So the bottom line is don't try to open a door necessarily by force. But we do need to jiggle the handles. <laughs> we do need to test things to see if the Lord is opening a door. Now, sometimes I've watched this happen. I've watched people who felt like, yeah, I feel this is what God's called me to do. And they jiggle the door, but it just never opens. And so they put the shoulder to the door or get out a battering ram. <laughs> We're going to plow this door open to get in. Listen, that never works. It never works. Sometimes we step in faith and we try things. And that's okay. Uh, but if you stepped into a direction... And you tried it, and it's just God's not opened the door like you thought. I, I believe me, I know. I, I went through it with Leesburg. Now, here's the thing: if you find yourself in a situation where you're you're kind of you've kind of got yourself in in, in a rabbit hole that uh oh th this isn't working out like I thought it was going to. Maybe I didn't have the mind of God quite like I thought to do. Okay, fine. This let's let's figure out what to do. Don't die there. Don't die there. I remember when I came to Norfolk. You all know this story, but I committed five years to Norfolk. Because I knew building a church was not going to be, uh, not going to be easy. It was going to be hard. I knew there was going to be a lot of setbacks. I committed to five Christmases in Norfolk. I, I told God, no matter what happens, no matter how bad it goes, for five years. I, and God, if you don't want me there longer than five years, you better tell me now. If, you don't, if it's going to be less than five years, you've got to tell me. Because if I make that commitment, I'm the, and I look back on it now after 34 years <laughs> and realize how the Lord must have been just about falling off the chair laughing at, at my antics of how I was trying to convince him I, I was so sure and he wouldn't answer me I didn't know that the reason that he wasn't going to answer me is because I was probably going to live and die in this city <laughs> but I committed those five years now here's the thing and, and people have asked me so why did you do that I'd say here's why because I decided when I went into this thing I'm doing this because this is what I truly felt I was called to do. But if I was mistaken, this was not going to become my graveyard. I'm not going to spend forever trying to accomplish something that I, God, I, God did not obviously anoint me to do. There's better things I can be doing with my time. So that's why I did it. Romans 10 and 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer... To God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have great zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That happens to us all sometimes at varying levels. That's why the Bible talks about the safety that comes with counseling. The multitude of counselors are safety. There is a, there is a safety to submitting to spiritual authority. I said it the other day in a... In a uh, thing online, you know, can two walk together lest they be agreed? Most of the time we, we say that as a declarative statement, but if you read it, it was actually a question with a question mark. Can two walk together lest they be agreed? And the real, the real answer is yes, they can if there is submission. And we, we talk so much about submission, you think we'd be masters of it. <laughs> but here's what we really do. So, you have to remember, you don't even need submission until there's disagreement. Until then, you're not in anything that requires submission. Submission is not an everyday thing. It's an occasional thing that's going to rise up. And so that's the answer to it. Another thing that will help us in all this is don't let fellowship become an Achilles heel to you. Now, what I mean by that is this. If you really want to be used of God, 
at some point in your walk with God, you're going to have to start spending a little less time with people and a little more time with God. So that the, the time that you do spend with people is anointed and impacting. It is about quality time, not quantity necessarily of time. We need to up our own time of study, our own time of prayer, our own reading time, worshiping time, spiritual pursuits in other words. Because you can get so busy. Now fellowship's important. But like anything else, if it gets out of balance, you know, and I don't want to trade praise for prayer or prayer for praise. And I, I certainly don't want to f- trade fellowship for prayer, for relationship with God. And if we get consumed with people, we will become like people. But if we can become consumed with God, we will begin to become like God. And that is what we're called to be. One other thing. Be careful that you don't spend a lot of time fighting the wrong battle. I've done that one. (laughs) You've heard the saying, you've got to pick and choose your battles wisely. There's a lot of truth to that. Because a lot of times we spend our energy fighting things that we're probably not going to win to start with. <laughs> or if we do win it, it <laughs> when you look back over it in inventory, it just was not worth all that ammo. <laughs> yeah, put, put ourselves in an ammo deficit for the next six months to win that battle that really didn't, you know, it didn't really do anything other than make us feel a little better. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10 on screen. Speaking of battle. Uh, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Everybody say imaginations. Mm -hmm. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, the reason that we need spiritual armor and spiritual weaponry is because our real battle in walking with God is not physical. It is spiritual in its nature. We need spiritual weapons to deal with internal issues that are going on in us. If we're sick in body, we need a physician because they're trained to understand flesh. But if I have spiritual maladies going on within, with, within me, I need spiritual weapons to, to help with that stuff. And these are the things, all this stuff I've been talking about is stuff that can help keep us from fainting. So l- let me talk about that fainting thing a minute. Bring up Luke 18. Uh, again, we, we talked about this parable that Jesus taught uh, a week or so ago. But I want to remind you about it. Remember this, the, the woman that came and said, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Okay. Everybody say, no fainting. <laughs> now, fainting means, in this case, means to be faint-hearted or to lose hope. Men ought always to learn how to pray and not to ever lose hope. So then he taught a parable about to teach that lesson. And he used the example of the unjust judge. He, as a matter of fact, he was a corrupt judge. He didn't fear God nor man. He was recklessly arrogant. And Jesus used it as an example because you remember the woman that had come to him and the persistence she had? She wanted revenge. And she kept pestering and pestering and pestering and pestering until finally he said, you know, he thinks to himself, this woman's going to drive me nuts. So I'm going to avenge her if for no other reason just to clear my docket and get her out of my way. He got so tired, he said, lest she weary me. He just wanted to get rid of this problem. But regardless of the motive of the judge, the woman got what she was after. 
And Jesus used that as an example of the power of prayer. Not praise, but prayer. Consistent, ongoing. Men ought always to learn how to pray and to faint not. Verse 6. That chapter, we skip down to verse 6. The Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. Shall not God adjudge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? But by bearing long, he said, though he may not get to it right away. He may, not, he, may not, he, may, he may put up with their crying for a long time. But eventually, God will respond to the cries of his people. Everybody say, cry out. One commentator uh, that I was reading about this noted that fainting, went all to always pray and faint not, it, fainting in that term was, was, went back to an old-fashioned archer that relaxed the, the bow. There was a string that you could pull that relaxed the tension on the bow. And so what would happen is you could have the arrow, you could have the bow, and you could have it all ready there, but the, but the tension was gone. And so you just couldn't shoot the thing. And he said that was, that was kind of the idea behind uh, men ought always to pray and to faint not. You don't want to lose the tension of your prayer. You don't want to lose the power that, that directs prayer. And if you lose that string that takes the tension off, there's no strength to shoot the arrows. And that's what he was talking about in being faint. So, so for our purposes tonight, having a fainting spell means when we get so tired, we just don't want to fight anymore. And there's all sorts of things that can do that, that can wear us down. You can be having ongoing marital problems. You can have rebellious kids. You can have any kind of long-term trial can do it. Sickness, illness, pain, job problems, money problems. It's not the stuff that comes just from time to time. It's that stuff that comes and just, you know, seems to become your address. <laughs> And it just lays on you. And it just, you know. And you hear the word saying, be not weary in well-doing. But yet, sometimes that's exactly what I've become. Weary, even though I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to do right. And doing right should bring joy and peace and all that. Not tiredness. Uh, but there's no question that, that doing right does come does cause weariness, but it's got to be checked. Again, there's things that God does to bring us rest from time to time. But weariness will lead us to an unproductive life. And when we're being unproductive, all of a sudden we wake up and we get so discouraged. And we get to feeling like there, there's, there's no hope. And then we make even worse decisions. Proverbs 13 says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. That's the truth. When you, if you come to a place where you lose hope and you no longer have hope for something in the future, it, it just it, it wears on you. And I do want to remind you that two times in the book of Daniel, in the seventh chapter, that, that Daniel prophesied that the Antichrist in the last days, his, his main objective is to wear out the saints of the Most High. Amen? Amen? So we got to know that's, his, that's the game he's playing at the end of the church age. He can't stop what God's doing. It's too powerful. The only hope he can do is to wear us out. The, the thing that God's moving on. If he, can, if he can just get us so weary that we lose hope and we faint. It's the same way that, you know, we just had to spend a bunch of money on the parking lots just to... You know, and, and don't think for a moment it doesn't drive me nuts to spend thousands of dollars on something that ain't new. <laughs> I mean, I can't look and say, hey, we built that. <laughs> no, it just kind of is still there. <laughs> I hate spending that much time. But the, here's the truth. Everything that you build has to have maintenance Amen. if you're wanting it to last. And the reason is because every seven, eight years or so, that all of the elements, the, 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 the snow, the rain, the cold, the heat, everything just, just works and works and works on everything that's built. And it will wear it down and, and, and cracks start coming in, potholes start coming in. And after a while, it just it, it, troubles come, so to speak, and it brings everything to crumbles. And bring up Proverbs 17, look at verse 11. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Now that word rebellion is interesting. 
interesting because in the Hebrew, the literally it would <clears throat> really would have been a word <coughs> that English probably would have been better translated bitterness. What's that mean? He said, therefore, a cruel messenger shall he shall be sent against him. In other words, anyone who is dealing with rebellion is probably working from some sort of an angle of bitterness. Even young people. You have a young person that's being rebellious. Okay, but somewhere in there, there's a bitterness there. Something didn't get dealt with properly, didn't get dealt with biblically. And I'm not <clears throat> suggesting it's always easy to find it. Well, sometimes we need the help of the Lord to, to, to get a diagnosis. But here's the thing. Bitterness always ends up breeding rebellion. And rebellion always ends up breeding hopelessness. And if you get bad roots in the plant, it cannot bring forth good fruit. It is going to ruin the fruit. Can you say amen? People rarely quit when they're having a sense of accomplishment. What makes us quit is when we feel like we've tried, 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 and tried, and the setbacks just keep draining us and draining us and draining us. Remember the woman in Luke 18. She, she, she had an adversary that she wanted avenged, and that word avenged in the Greek meant to vindicate or to punish she, she wanted some justice done. And the judge said he would avenge her. But, but Jesus, when he spoke about this, it, it's interesting. Go back to Luke 18. Bring up verse 6. Hear what the unjust judge saith. He shall, and, and he goes into God. And shall not God avenge, everybody say avenge, mm. his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Here's what's interesting in that chapter. Um, there were different words used, two different words used in the Greek for avenge. The English translators translated both of them the same, just avenge. But they had two different Greek words. The first one, I don't even know how to pronounce it, it's P-O-I- EO, but it, it meant a prolonged form or to make do. That's the kind of thing that was talking about when he said, uh, you know, though I bear along with them. In other words, there's sometimes God, God will deal with things in his time. Okay. But when he deals with them in those times, he's not destroying our adversary. Our adversary is allowed to be there, but God's grace is to... That's what happened with Paul when he was praying and, and, and said, I, I want rid of this thing. I prayed three times. God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. There, there is a type of God's vengeance that he is not destroying your enemy. He's just gracing you with the ability to survive it. But there's a second one. Ectodicasis. I, I don't know how it's pronounced. I don't know if study Greek. <laughs> But this one's a little different. This is the one we know. It means vindication or retribution. Now that's the thing God does. And when he, when he said that God shall avenge them, though he bear long, he said, I'll avenge, I'll get to it in my time, but when I do, it will be with vindication. Wrath. Can you bring up Romans 12? And 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. That's the goal. Some people make it difficult. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, do what? Huh? That just don't even feel right, does it? <laughs> don't even sound right, let alone feel right. If he thirsts, what are you going to do for him? Give him a drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus was literally saying, do it my way. <laughs> but 
But God said, don't you avenge. Don't you go after vindication. Because vindication is mine, saith the Lord. I'll take care of it. I'll judge it properly. I'll apply the right amount of power to it. But if you get consumed with trying to vindicate, that bitterness starts rising up. And the reason we're told to let God handle it is because we wreck ourselves when we try to do it. Now Jesus said that his people that would cry out day and night unto him would be heard. So I was curious, what does crying out really mean? There's over 200 references in the Bible that talk about crying out. And there's different Greek words that are used for it. Kind of sometimes different meanings. But all of us as human beings have three parts that we know of. We have body, soul, and spirit. And when we cry out from the body, that's usually because we're in pain. You ever hit your thumb with a hammer or hurt yourself even worse than that and get, you know, the pain, the agony of being in pain, we can cry out from its physical pain. When the body's crying out, it's from physical pain. But, there, but when the spirit cries out, soul of a person cries out that's that's due to grief that that's due to loss it, it there's something that cries from the human spirit it's not the same thing as when you cry from physical pain and then there's an interesting kind of crying out that Paul brought up bring up Romans chapter 8 Paul Paul dealt with this uh, we know this verse but can I read again verse 26 likewise the spirit also everybody say the holy ghost mm -hmm. helps us with our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us uh, with groanings which cannot be uttered that is a form of crying out that is a very deep spiritual thing. It's something that comes from the depth of the human spirit. It's something that comes from a place because the Holy Ghost, and in God's spirit, the Holy Ghost within us has interacted with our human spirit and has created a crying out to the spirit world that God says, I hear it. And we call it intercessory prayer, but it's a form of crying out. Bring up 2 Corinthians 5 real quick. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this, in this we, what? Groan. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we, we that are in this tabernacle, talking about still in our flesh, still alive in our flesh, we do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Here's the point. God responds to the cry of the human spirit. And the Holy Ghost, it, it's so powerful, when the Holy Ghost interacts with the human spirit, it creates a cry, and, and we call it intercessory prayer. It's a form of crying out to God. It's a groaning that cannot be uttered. We don't even know the things that are being said. There's all kinds of examples throughout the Bible. Exodus 2, Israel cried out in bondage and God remembered his promise to him and he solved the problem. Israel cried out in Exodus 14 at the Red Sea and God split the sea for them. Moses cried out for water in Exodus 17 and God opened up a rock and brought water out of a rock for them. The people cried out in fear over, over fire in number 7 but Moses testified that God came and delivered. He heard them in their cry. Samuel cried out to be saved from the Philistines in 1 Samuel 7, and God delivered him. We can go on and on. There's examples all throughout the Word of God. But, but one of the more moving stories, bring up 2 Samuel 22. This is a story of David. Verse 4. I will call on the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, who shall 
or so shall I be saved from mine enemies. Now listen to this. Have you ever felt like this? When the waves of death come past me, and the floods of the ungodly men made me afraid, the sorrows of hell come past me about, the snares of death pre prevented me. Look at verse 7. In my distress, everybody say distress, I called upon God. I cried out. Now, I want to tell you something. When you're in that kind of level of stress and depression and anxiety, he wasn't talking about just, hey, I, 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 I mentioned it to the Lord in passing. I could use some help here. Oh, this was, a, this was a powerful crying out. I cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter his ears. There is something so profound that happens when a person cries out to God from within. It is something that I think God can hardly walk away from. Just as I know God is drawn to faith, God, I, I think God is drawn to faith like a bug to a bug zapper. <laughs> he sees faith, he's on it. <laughs> And I think when a human being cries out to God, now here's, here's what, if we would be honest, we might as well, we're sitting in church. <laughs> but if we would be honest, sometimes we have spent a lot of time venting and complaining and fussing and arguing but not really crying out to God. Sometimes we get mad and we may vent at God or whoever else happens to be listening. Or we'll get on the phone, call a family member or whoever, you know, we'll vent. that's not prayer is my point. That's not crying out unto God. Whining and complaining is not praying. It's not there, because that level of crying out has to come from a place of brokenness. Is when we get so tired of trying to fix this thing ourselves that we finally become willing to shut up. Because <laughs> I just don't even feel like fussing with it anymore. I'm broken. I've got to cry out unto God from within. Psalms 34 on screen. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Again, he may not always do it overnight, but he'll get there. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save us such as of a contrite spirit. See, if, the, if we would be honest, we would have to admit that sometimes we have not got to the place of brokenness and contriteness because we're still at the anger stage. We're just still mad. We've got something that ain't the way it'd be, and we're mad about it. <laughs> but the Bible does say that we are to, you know, be angry but sin not. And we're even instructed to try to get the anger issue resolved before you go to sleep. Now, why is that? I think probably the greatest reason that the Lord explained to us the need to do that is because very, very, very few things ever get solved in anger. So the Lord was helping us. He said, don't waste another day with this. Don't let, don't let this take you in. The, now, if you want to really get something done in the Spirit, come to a place of brokenness. Come to a place of being having a contrite start. Here's why, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Anybody that's been walking with God for a lot of years has testimonies like this. And, and, and every one of us can tell us times that, that God delivered us fairly quickly. But if you're worth your salt in the kingdom... You have some testimonies about stuff you wrestled with for a long time. 
But thank God he finally broke that. Came to me. Tears, when we cry in the physical, it's a physical manifestation of something that's happening inside of us. It can be tears of joy. It can be tears of sadness. It can be tears of brokenness, tears of loss, tears of grief. Yes, you hit your thumb with the hammer, you can cry. <laughs> but as soon as the pain's gone, the crying will stop. But when, when the wound is in, inside, it just keeps emanating and keeps emanating, and tears start flowing. I didn't, I didn't know this, but I, I, I read something in the midst of all this, is that tears actually have a coating in them, uh, human tears that actually fight bacteria. That's interesting. <laughs> it's like the Lord's always helping us out. <laughs> but 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 and and by the way, tear. There are some tears that that deep weeping kind. They 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 contain proteins. That's why if you've ever tasted your tears, they have a salty taste to them. And by the way, if you don't wipe your face, you will taste your tears. Because most of the way of our faces are designed, if you cry for a while, guess where it goes? <laughs> right to the kisser. <laughs> and you will end up tasting tears. And when you're tasting your own tears, it's a, it's a troubling time. Bring up Second Kings. I only got a few minutes left, but you remember... You remember when uh, Hezekiah, when the prophet went, told him to get his house in order because his sickness is unto death and he needs to get it straightened out. And, and as the man of God's leaving the castle, the Spirit of the Lord moves on him. It came to pass, verse 4, 2 Kings 24, 20 and verse 4, it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out of the middle of court that the word of the Lord came unto him saying, Turn again. And tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. Don't tell me prayer can't change things. But sometimes we have to understand it's not the, it's not the little you know, check off the grocery list type praying that gets it done. But Hezekiah had turned his face to the wall and had cried out. And for whatever reason, God decided to respond to this particular prayer. He said, and here, notice why. He said, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day. and You shall go up to the house of the Lord. David actually believed that God keeps a record of our tears. We know he keeps a record of our prayers. Psalms 56 and 8 says, Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into a bottle. Are they not in thy book? And when I cry, then shall mine enemies turn back. And this I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. Go to Psalm 6 real quick in these last couple of minutes. Depart from me, verse 8, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. What I'm trying to get at is that God does not usually, I don't think, respond to prayer that is driven by a spirit of anger or a spirit of frustration. Because really, if we'll be honest, you know, just like we'll vent to a family member or we'll yell at somebody else and we're, we're just not happy and rah, 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 you know, and, and, and it just affects our mood. It does the same thing when we go to God in prayer. We end up going to God in prayer and instead of having a, a prayer relationship with God, we're, we're just barking at God and calling it prayer. And my experience has been I've never had anything hugely dramatic happen that was driven out of anger when I'm bringing it to God. There ha but I will tell you this, some of the greatest things that have ever happened in my walk with God 
have usually happened after tears. The brokenness, the contriteness. But sometimes we're not there yet because we're too busy being mad about it. So my advice to you tonight is, when it comes to fainting spells, how to, how to avoid fainting spells, how to keep from being, you're going to have to decide to trade all that anger and frustration in and realize, number one, it ain't, it ain't solving the problem. But trade it in and let it turn into brokenness. Let it turn into a contriteness that causes you to cry out unto God. It is in that crying out that God will respond. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If I just don't get so sidetracked. Isaiah 28, two more verses and we're wrapping. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest. Everybody say rest. That may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing that, but yet they would not hear. Now Isaiah was literally prophesying about the, the, the coming of the Spirit of God. He said there's a time of rest coming. There's a time of refreshing coming. And in Acts chapter 3, it was, it was denoted that this was the fulfillment of it in verse 19 when they preached, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. God wants to deliver us from fainting spells. And in order to do it, we gotta, we, we, we got to get rid of the anger. We just we gotta we gotta get the, the frustration and the stuff. It just it's got to become somehow a brokenness. That's the kind of prayer that God can't hardly say no to. He can't hardly ignore it. He's drawn to faith, and I believe he's drawn to the cries of his people. Stand with me tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. There's a beautiful presence of the Lord in the house tonight. And I think it would be well for us if we could just take a moment. Would you mind lifting your hands unto the Lord and just lift your voice up right now? And would you just entertain that presence of the Lord with worship? Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, I praise you, Father. Jesus, I love your name tonight, God. And I thank you for your beautiful presence and your anointing that's here. Lord, I feel like you're, you've helped anoint me tonight. Now I'm asking you to anoint your people. Anoint them to engraft this word. Anoint them to take this word. God, revelate their mind and their thinking tonight. Deal with us as your people. That we can cry out unto you and you will hear us in our cry. We will reap as long as we don't faint. Oh, hallelujah. Now somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Give God a shout of praise. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I want to see you make it to the end. I don't want to see you end up on the floor like this guy. <laughs> Let's ask God to heal our, our fainting spells. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Some watching online, we're glad to, to, to minister tonight. We bless you in the name of the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday in Jesus' name.